Hey, it is your buddy Peace and Harmony with you here today. Much love going out to all the beautiful Empowered Harmonizers. And we're zooming in and focusing in today on a great viewer question, and that is to understand covert narcissist rage. How does this manifest? Basically, what is this? And this is a great viewer question, so we're going to zoom in and focus in on this here in this video and also understand the dynamics and roles that it plays and sort of how you interact with this person and then how that overlaps furthermore into other areas of your life and holds you back and keeps you stuck, keeps you blocked, keeps you in a self-limiting belief pattern. So to understand the covert narcissist is to understand the word covert, which means undetected beneath the surface, beyond really the perception of the senses. It's like, you know, the it's, it's something that is not seen. It is what is not seen, which is what you really want to understand, is that on the scene, the surfer, surface, this person might seem very cool, calm, collected, a uh, very few words, um, a very few friends, a uh, very few emotions, yet they have sort of a stoic or command presence about them. They have an air of superiority. They can be highly intelligent. They can be highly tall. They might be short. They might be musically talented or not talented. They might have high professional status or not, but there's generally sort of a pervasive kind of emanating out that this person, there's an air of superiority that they can't be messed with. They can't be tangled with. There is no ruffling their feathers. And this sort of the, where the pathology comes in, where it's abnormal is really the lack of communication of opinions, feelings, or input. And the rage is then precipitated by people who either try to ruffle the feathers, get them to be responsible and accountable, um, bury their routine, bury their focus, call them out, hold them accountable for really a sort of deficit or where you see a passivity in the relationship, a lack thereof. So a lack of communication, a lack of affection, this can then create an incompatibility within the relationship, especially as it moves on forward. Things, roles become very clear cut. Some people can handle this. Some people can sublimate, meaning for the lack of the relationship, they can have other areas of their life make up and then fill the void of the relationship or feel the presence of lack thereof. So the other party is happy but otherwise there is a sort of a brooding, seething, covert rage. And a rage is a feeling of hostility or anger. So, uh, you, know, a, you know, a sort of um, expulsion of such. So rage is a negative emotion. Oftentimes it is what has gone um, neglected, denied, repressed, suppressed, ignored, not expressed, swept under the rug, whatever phrase you want to refer it to, basically it is rage which has been bottled up and not communicated and then becomes expressed in unhealthy ways. Unhealthy largely meaning not directly to the person, the situation, the circumstance, which is the true causation. So it becomes perverted or reverted to an innocent party or it, you know, it's a lack of addressing thereof. So in other words, because the covert narcissist <clears throat> has this sense of superiority, entitlement, self-importance, and a lack of empathy means that they're not always going to communicate in the right or healthy or appropriate channels their feelings, emotions as such. So they're gonna be very tight-lipped, meaning a few words, not addressing it, you feel you don't really know their stance, you don't know how they feel. So this then causes people to take action regardless, do regardless, cause covert narcissist rage. In other words, um, if I don't hear from you, then. 
you know, if, if I don't, you know, have action from you then. Well, if you don't do this, then I will. So it becomes a lot of this sort of passive aggressive reaction in the other party. It causes people then to become a force to this counterforce. So it causes other people to then have to, they're, they're then placed into a force situation where they have to respond, they have to react, they have to take responsibility, they have to take the burden, they have to, you know, stand up and get the job done. Um, and oftentimes this puts people in a very uncomfortable position because they feel that they are taking on more than their due responsibility. You know, they're taking on a, uh, a position of over obligation. And then eventually, this covert narcissist rage, with that, which then is expressed as sort of a, uh, a very strong quietness, a strong retreating, a very, you know, look of disappointment, an, a lack of attendance. The covert narcissist rage is only expressed or processed within the confines of that covert narcissist. In other words, they harbor these feelings within they don't express it without. They will, you know, some people feel that they're in their own quote unquote fantasy world, you know, in the confines and they don't ever communicate it. So whether it's a fantasy world, whether they pervert it as such, whether they go on websites or do whatever, um, or, you know, uh, cheat or have infidelities behind this person's back is not, you know, a cut and dry um, situation but it's to understand that the rage then is always um, expressed in an indirect manner, an indirect manner, meaning not directly with the person, you're not gonna get a clear communication. So if you don't have the clear communication, essentially that means things are not going to be resolved, addressed, straightforward, clear cut, honest, and forthright. It means that there is going to be a lack thereof. You're not getting the full story. You're not getting, you know, you're, you're not getting their viewpoints. They are the bottled up. They are the covert narcissist. They are, you know, keeping this sort of feeling to themselves. And so you'll see it as a quiet, what others describe as a quiet rage. And so, you know, and then, you know, because they are really um, in my view, viewpoint, sort of afraid to communicate. Um, they're not going to waste their time, so to speak. Um, they're not going to address. They're just going to skip over. They're going to ignore. They're going to befuddle. They're going to cause others to have to assume and be very assumptive or put up with this retreat, put up with the lack of communication, put up with the lack of affection, you know, deal with the lack of uh, support, deal with the lack of honesty. Notice the word, the operative word here is deal with. It causes everyone else to have to deal with or cope, make up for the inaccuracies or shortcomings thereof. So whether you accept these shortcomings, you forgive them and let them go, um, would be advised because to harbor and then maintain this coping is to cause a lot of burden onto yourself. So the more that you're just coping and not living, the more you're just coping. You're putting up a lot of your energy and attendance to the coping mechanisms. And underneath it all, subconsciously, unconsciously, there's a feeling of uh, dissatisfaction or I am missing out. I am not getting, I am not receiving. And so the rage of the covert narcissist is the quiet rage. It's that which you must then cope with. It's not what is expressed. It is not what is, it is what is not expressed. So, you know, this quiet rage then might be manifest or experienced as, you know, lack of participation, lack of communication, the old cold shoulder, the old I'm in the basement, the old I'm in the garage, I'm in the attic, you know, I'm at the store, I'm down the street, I am not home, you know, and then just sort of, a, you know, an in acknowledgement of others. And so it's not so much what they do, it's what they don't do. So it's very hard 
to kind of, it's, you know, like pull this person out of their shell because it's what's going on within, you know, it's the hiding thereof that then causes others to have to cope and then do without. <clears throat> Whether it's withholding finances, um, you know, withholding uh, communication, you know, it's, you know, them showing up um, or being not ready. It's them um, being, you know, extremely um, meek. In other words, being weaker than really they're capable of, meaning, you know, very bottled up, um, not present, um, you know, sort of, you know, injuring themselves, um, you know, during, you know, certain tasks where then they can't fulfill, you know, they, they feel that they're in over their head, but they're used to not communicating, you know, like if you want to put them up to a task and even though they're not comfortable doing it, they don't want to do it, they're, they're not, it's not fun for them, it's not interesting, rather than the covert narcissist communicating as such, I don't feel I have to do this or etc. They just go along with it anyway. Then you've got the quiet rage. The quiet rage then basically comes up in mishaps, um, uh, you know, small automobile accidents, um, people cutting themselves, you know, injurious behaviors, you know, uh, the old mess, the old spilling of the rice on the floor, the old spilling of the oil, the gasoline, you know, these passive aggressive expressions of I am not happy. So it's the quiet rage. It's the I'm not happy here that then you have to put up with and tolerate. Yet then it's always flipped around and I have to put up and tolerate with you. So it's like looking at the real cause is creating the effect or this tension in the relationship. And, you know, really there becomes a point, especially as you evolve and move forward in the relationship, that tension is undesirable. It is not wanted. It becomes uncomfortable. It's kind of like the pair of jeans. Either it can look very nice when it's a perfect fit. In fact, a little tight, it might look very attractive. But when it's too tight, there's a lot of tension and it's uncomfortable. You want to get out of those pair of jeans. You want to get out of those, you know, shoes, whatever it is. It's like a not, it's not a good fit. The tension is uncomfortable. That is the confines of self-limiting beliefs or feeling that you're having to put up with and cope with a very uncomfortable situation. <clears throat> so self-limiting beliefs very much are that way. It becomes too tight. You become underemployed. You become undereducated. You become living in too small an area. You become not meeting your potential. This is what really... Um, you know, when you're in, it's basically like the universe telling you, you deserve more. You are bigger than this. You are, there's something you can't quite figure out. You can't quite get accountability for. You can't quite, you know, flush out in the relationship. You know, there is this, it could be worked through, it could be communicated, but the covert narcissist has a very strong stance and they will not let it go. This is in my viewpoint, a lifelong uh, personality trait, um, whether it serves them well, perhaps it does. You know, this is just how they work through relationships. This is how they work through life. Love it or leave it. I mean, that's basically what it boils down to. So a covert narcissist, um, you know, this is the quiet rage. And as we know, you know, rage is... Um, it's not a desirable situation. You know, in fact, you don't want to breed it. Um, you don't want to um, allow it to fester. You want to deal with it. Um, you know, you want to process it. And, you know, so then it is to communicate once again. It is to take the high road. And it's to, you know, address and then put limits to um, boundaries and standards. It's to have validation enough confidence enough within, you know, that <clears throat> this is causing, you know, a sort of a, a void or a tension. And, you know, this has gone on for quite a, a long period of time. And then ask them for their viewpoint, well, what do you think we should do about this? Get them participating, get them to release some of the tension so that you're not, quote unquote, dealing with this quiet rage to the point where, 
you're not having to put up with an, a, a lack in the relationship. You know, if, if this is your spouse, you know, your, your sibling, your parent, your grandparent, your neighbor, your boss, you know, um, ask their viewpoint. You know, that's a good way for you to address, um, you know, and, and really stand up and then sort of face your fears. One thing I feel that is crucial and important in the covert narcissist relationship is to face your fears, face the music. It's not going to get better if you just ignore it. As my dentist used to say on his poster, when you were getting your teeth cleaned, there was a poster on the ceiling while you're getting your teeth cleaned. Ignore your teeth and they'll go away. Ignore your teeth and they'll go away. So it's the old, <clears throat> you know, it, just ignore it. It's kind of like you don't want to ignore that rattling in the car. It's only going to get worse. Same thing is with a covert narcissist rage. Don't ignore it because it will not go away. You need to bring it out of them. Have it checked out. Get it into the light. Air it out. Shake out the rug that has been it, <clears throat> where it has been swept under. <clears throat> Excuse me. Begin to you know go into the corner where things have been pushed aside. Begin to uh, loose, um, illuminate that darkness. Begin begin to you know, get an opening up of that bottle of worms. Begin to open up and get their viewpoint. So you might find that the covert narcissist is very articulate about their coping mechanisms and you will begin to be, you know, gain insight into why they do what they do. The cause that's created this effect in the relationship. It is very uncomfortable to live with a quiet rage. It's to live with the family secrets is to live with, you know, a sort of feeling of secrecy and what is become secret becomes hidden and becomes eventually a self-limiting belief or harbors, um, resentment, regret, and self doubt and low self-esteem. So all those are factors and components of then what then props up self-limiting beliefs, unhappiness, you know, feeling that things could be better, things I'm, you know, I know could be better, yet I can't quite articulate it. So those are the secrets. And really when, you know, M. Scott Peck, um, who feels that really sort of lying is the root of all m mental il illness. In other words, the pathological lies, the lying to oneself, the lying to others. So lying to yourself in this situation will look like, well, I will just have to put up with this. This is all I'll ever become. This is all I deserve. I am not lovable. Um, this is all I'll ever get in life. So that is really what self, you know, lying to oneself looks like, feels like, sounds like. Um, I am a miserable person. I have this coming. I am um, a terrible person. I am out of control. So this is all I'll ever get. Um, I am, you know, whatever, whatever to the core. And this is all I'll ever attract. This person is right. This is what self pathology or lying to oneself looks like. Um, I can never do better in life. Um, I will never be happy. I don't have what it takes. I am too stupid. I am not attractive enough. I am not tall enough. My skin color is not the right color. I don't have the right intellect. I don't have the right emotions. I don't have the right friends. I don't live in the right area of the world. This is all what sort of self lying looks like where you're putting yourself, it becomes an internalized as the self put downs, the negative validation, which then you then internalize, you become, it becomes an internal uh, critic, which you have then internalized from this outside source. So it is to address this, then quiet rage, this lack of validation, which you have then received as self limiting, self lack, self limiting beliefs and holding you back. And then, which is then propping this up. So it's to look at that and then see how you are living in a self denial. This can be very painful. It can be very painful to address self-limiting beliefs 
where you have gone it wrong, where you have put up with too much. You have lived, you know, the bad life. You have, you know, stuck around with the wrong crowd. You have allowed, you know, this anger to be part of your life. The bad boy, the bad girl, the wrong side of the tracks. I can't get out of this mess. It's the I can't and the I am not, which then your identity becomes circumvented around. But the truth of the matter is you do have what it takes. You are lovable. You are deserving. You can go to the other side of the tracks. You can embrace your value of yourself. You don't need to live in this tension. You don't need to have the shoes too small, the jeans too tight, the wrong, you know, environment where you're living. You can expand. It is self-belief and then addressing this. So again, the covert narcissist, it is to, to how do you, what is a good tool? It is to have the rigorous honesty, the boldness and audacity to be able to confront this negative feeling within yourself and say, you know, and to speak the words, you know, I don't want to live this way. I don't want the flying monkeys. I don't want to stay in contact with this viewpoint. You know, I must love and let them go. It is to almost to let go of that value that has been propping you up that I must always put up with this, which is a belief. It is to let go of those beliefs. It's to find like a new religion of self. It's to find a new, you know, a new spirituality of empowerment versus disempowerment. And some people have held on so dearly to um, lack of self-belief that it becomes their, their spirituality, that it is so um, it is so deep within them, it is so much part of them that they don't know what to believe if they wouldn't believe this negativity. They, they don't have, you know, belief are like the legs of a table. It's like if you let go of this lack of self-belief, the table would fall down. My life would fall down. You need to have another belief to prop it up. Um, Tony Robbins in his book, Awaken the Giant Within, does have this in one of his chapter and he talks about how powerful beliefs are. Beliefs are like the legs of a table which prop you up in your life. It causes you to do, feel, think, and decide and choose accordingly. So it it is really important to understand and uproot these beliefs, how you believe about self. Um, for example, you know, I, I believe that I must, because this is my family, I must put up with this tension. Because this is my spouse, I must put up with this tension. To, you know, because this is my work, I must put up with this tension. I'm not able to, you know, expand my wings and fly. I'm not able to smile. I'm not able to be joyful. I'm not able to be lovable. You know, it is to feel, it is to take their quiet rage, the crazy making, and then identify, I am the weak one. I am the scapegoat. You know, those are the manifestations that you are around unaddressed covert narcissist rage. <clears throat> and so it is to say, you know, no, my, I create my beliefs. My beliefs are not created and conformed by those standards outside of myself. They are created within. That is to tap into the reservoir, the, uh, the, um, the uh, source within, and is to test, identify and test that you, you know, can smoke out or dissolve or address and work through that negative feeling and not to be driven by that, not to have the compulsive self-denial, the you know um, obsession of I am not good enough. Um, it is to dissolve and get rid of that. Uh, you know, you have to find out how thick is this propping me up? Is this a two by four within me? Is this like a little peg leg? Or is this like, you know, the center of the table, like those old tables where they had the big core, you know, within, and then they had, you know, is this propping up my life from the center? Is this negative belief about myself that I can't address this, that I've put up with this tension for too long? Can I address this? Can I say, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to let go of this unresolved tension, this lack of addressing can I address it with this person um, or can I address it within myself so I can address the rage and no longer be held back like a net, a self-limiting belief from this? 
so it is to face the fear. It is to call it out. Um, that is a great tenant um, in the Sandler um, uh, tradition, David Sandler, where you speak your fears. So, um, you know, if I were not um, held back by this feeling, this trauma bond, or this sort of, you know, feeling sorry or being able to take up all the slack for this person, if I were to let that go, who could I become? What would I become? Where would I go? What would I do? How would I feel? How would I develop? How would I grow? How would I spread it out? In other words, growing is the expansion or spreading out thereof. It's then when you open up that space, it gives you a whole different energetic field with which to receive. So to live in that tension is to look at all those fine details that go with the coping lifestyle, the putting up with lifestyle, the, you know, I can't quite address it lifestyle is to, you know, allow the closet, closet drinker, the, you know, closet uh, drug door, the closet um, spouse who's cheating on the back end. Um, it's to get out of, as they say, you know, the truth will set you free. It is to address the lies. It is to address the secrecy, you know, the family secrets, the self secrets, and to get them out of your life. Well, peace and harmony, this has always been a family secret. If you keep it bottled up, you are keeping energy. There's going to take more energy to keep it, you know, bottled up than it is to release it. The family secrets, the relationship secrets, eventually, you know, need to be released and let go. They are not the fuel for a better self or a good lifestyle. It is to say, you know, I no longer want to live the lie. I no longer want to live the secret. I don't want that secret to hold me back. I am sick and tired of it, you know. I can't live the secret anymore. And to be able to speak and be a leader through and evaporate and dissolve that secrecy is to really herald and champion you know, what your spirit has been trying to get to you all along. You know, I, um, I can't have this. I love you, but, you know, it's to let you go and to know that, you know, a lot of people feel, well, I would be nobody with this, without this person. This person has been uh, an integral part of my life. Well, that is okay. Love them for that and love them for that and begin to you know, incorporate more and address more into your life and realize that you're, it's the fear of abandonment that is keeping you stuck. It's the fear of, I won't get that is keeping you stuck. So address that sort of secret of, you know, fear of abandonment that's keeping you in that self-limiting belief that, you know, you must, you know, walk around them like you're just, you know, um, someone might take them away or take this tension away. So you have to realize that oftentimes the most creative and productive life is lived in more of a quiet intensity. It's not built up on this tension. It's, you know, it, especially as you mature in life, it's, it's not based on this tension. The tension will really cause a lot of the adrenal and the fatigues and this tension. And then living with things like the secret, you know, when is this next going to, you know, um, you know, poison or toxic in the relationship, in the family, um, our next generation, etc. That's where all you know, this sort of, you know, tension comes from. So begin to address it. Um, begin to be the one who champions the cause. Begin to be the one who um, addresses this tension and to say, <clears throat> you know, this is, um, you know, this, this is mine. This is my viewpoint. Um, you know, it's been so long that this has been addressed. You know, this has gotten out of balance. Um, this is how, what I need. Um, this is what I have coming. This is what I want. This is what I sense. Um, and you can then address the covert narcissist. You know, it seems that you're uncomfortable with, um, and just, but you need to address it, but not be caught up in the tension. So you need to be able to separate your own self from the tension and really sort of not take on what is not yours. So don't take on the tension the ego that is not yours. Don't take on the insecurity that is not yours. Don't take that negativity on as your own. Come at it with a pure perspective and face that and then be able to have those self-beliefs which are holding you up. Not the self-limiting beliefs, that the, but the self, 
enhancing beliefs that then foster and then things will go your way once you're able to acknowledge and validate that and then not allow the quiet rage to, uh, to become a toxic element or a secret or a tension in your life. You don't allow that to taint you. Um, it's a very interesting word, taint, and it's really to get that out 100% and it really will give you a great shift of energy and to reinforce this, you need to really work that recovery journal. Do those pages of writing in the morning. You'll find that as a storehouse within you is a storehouse of solutions. Your, your subconscious is, and the universe as well, knows what you really want, knows what you really need, knows what you really are to be happy with. So it's the flip side oftentimes with what you are used to. It is really the truth and is to live along those tenets and those guide points on a moment by moment basis and realize and really begin to identify and become sensitive to the self enhancing beliefs, <clears throat> the self, um, uh, you know, uh, ingratiating beliefs that help you to put yourself on the next level up versus the next level down, which is when you're sort of caught up in that net of covert narcissist rage, begin to identify it, begin to call it out and address it, begin to put the positive energy on your side and begin to repeat those astromations. I am, I deserve, I love, you know, I love this and, you know, I deserve and begin to, you know, if you're, if you've got this fear of abandonment or fear of retaliation, you know, I love you and, you know, um, I trust my, you know, this is the way to go and so begin to develop that perspective. So it'll, with that, that thinking, that positive orderly direction thinking, it'll pull you out of that negative tension perspective. And so you'll be able to get some distance from it. But oftentimes people are fearful of success. So therefore they want to stay caught in that tension. They want to stay caught up in that rage, you know? So it's to realize that the positive will overcome the negative. Try this out, reinforce it, begin to use your verbalization that gives you the self-enhancing beliefs, the self-enhancing communication, allow this person to be who they are, ex you know, get them to open up on their decision making. So it'll take away their power over you and then you will become empowered. It's a very interesting dynamic and amazing when you work through it. You can do this. You got it. It's your buddy. Peace and harmony with you here today. And I hope that these videos do help. Please share and please subscribe for more great tools, videos, discussion, and support. Peace out. Love you.